Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, welcome to today's talk on the made in market and how difficult it is for men and women to navigate it. Relationships are possibly the most personal matter in our lives. We do not often allow for other people to comment, comment on them, even if their remarks would be constructive. I'm very happy that today you are all making an exception and are here to listen to the comments of our guest, Dr. Mark Regneris, on the true nature of the relationships that you, as well as I, are all living. Mark Regneris is an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also a researcher at the university's Population Research Center and a senior fellow at the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. You may have heard of Mark Regneris due to the research he published in 2012 on the adult children of parents who have same-sex relationships. His main areas of research are, however, sexual behavior of young adults and family formation. He wrote three books on the topics, uh, Forbidden Fruit in 2007, Premarital Sex in America, How Young Americans Meet, Mate, and Think About Marrying in 2011, and the most recent one that is coming out right now called Cheap Sex, The Transformation of Men, Marriage, and Monogamy. Just his aforementioned accomplishments would be enough to make Mark Regneris as their author an appropriate speaker for tonight. But you can take the word of George Weigel, who believes Mark to be a remarkable person and scholar due to two of his qualities. The first one is his honest and truth-seeking nature. Mark Regneris has devoted his career to exploring the reality of today's dating culture by using em empirical analysis and economic concepts. Facts are what he is after. The second one is his courage. Mark has not stayed away from difficult topics and has persevered in his work despite the unpopularity it has earned him. In other words, Mark Regneris is looking for the truth of things and isn't afraid to tell you when he finds it, even when it touches the most private area of your lives, your relationships. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Regneris. <laughs> It's good to be here. Uh, tonight, compared to last night, I'll be talking about something that's more squarely and long-term in my uh, primary areas of interest, and that's sort of the, the generation and the continuation of uh, relationships between men and women. So let's get this out of the way quickly and upfront. Sex is, among other things, a social transaction. It is not the only way to understand the matter, thanks be to God, but it is an illuminating one. Like it or not, there is a basic exchange that typically precedes relationships and constitutes the social setting in which they begin, end, or continue. Each person is giving, giving the other person something of themselves. Although it might appear at face value to be the same something, intimate access to each other's body, there's typically quite a bit more going on than meets the eye. Men and women tend to experience it differently. Their interests are often different. Their sex drives are often, though not always, different. Men tend to direct far more mental time, attention, and effort towards sex than women do on average. And this is a global reality. Women, on the other hand, tend to be more, actually, by the way, this is the book itself. It comes out September 1st. I'm giving you a, like a highlight overview of it today. This was a video we made, short version of it. Women, on the other hand, tend to be more malleable sexually. They're more likely to change their mind about sexual matters, either to engage or to refrain, and tend to go without sexual activity for longer periods than men. And as we can see in this, in two different data sets in the United States, they're more likely, especially during the late teens and 20s into their 30s, to self-identify not as entirely 100% heterosexual, whereas men tend to be much more of a flat line. Women take far fewer risks for sex than men. They're more apt to regret one-night stands than men. To my knowledge, I can think of 
few to no politician, women politicians who have been embroiled in their own sex scandal. You may think this is all a simple matter of socialization and that a different approach to raising boys and girls could change things or that Catholic or Christian men and women would not be like this if only it were that easy and be careful of what you wish for. Economically speaking, at least in the heterosexual world, women have what men want, economically speaking, which means they possess something of considerable value to men, something that conceivably costs men something to access. Historically, men would have to give something most typically significant economic or relational commitments or promises in order to gain access to her body. Yes, it's true that men appreciate women for other reasons, and I'm going to get to that, but that doesn't make this part less true. At the same time, sex is not typically of value to women in quite the same way. We see this in the in a sort of a blunt form in the market in prostitution. Women never pay for sex. I have seen multiple surveys asking questions about paying for sex. I've never seen a woman say yes. This is not how they roll, and that's a good thing. But it means that in the mating market more broadly, there is demand, interested men, and supply women. Seems like a crude way to talk about it, doesn't it? But it means that women are the sexual gatekeepers in their relationships. Men infrequently function as gatekeepers of sex in their relationship because they're not very good at it, right? And the main reason that gay men tend to have far more partners than straight men is not because straight men don't want to have that many partners, but, but they're, they're in a relationship with a gatekeeper, whereas men having sex with other men, there is no primary gatekeeper. I'm not saying I approve of all this, but I think on average as a sociologist, this is actually how the system works. It is not necessarily how people think, but it's how they act. My job as a sociologist is to understand how the world works out there, even if it's not the way I want it to be. And it isn't. And remember, realities do not threaten the validity of our ideals. They just make you aware of the challenges that exist to realizing those ideals. But far better to recognize those challenges than to be utterly unaware of those challenges. So I talk a lot about mating markets. A mating market is an invisible social structure in which the search for a partner occurs, while a marketplace is a visible particular place where one actually searches for that partner, like a bar, a parish, a gym, or a workplace. I sometimes use the terms mating pool and mating market interchangeably. Although the, the, in reality, the pool is all-encompassing, but within it there are distinctive markets, such as the market in short-term relationships, the market in long-term relationships, the marriage market, as well as the market of sex for sale. All this market talk sounds very utilitarian, unromantic, objectifying, and not remotely Christian. But it's simply recognizing that people do not meet other people randomly, nor do they meet whomever they want and do whatever they want with them. There are constraints, and despite the sound of the term constraints, constraints actually enable they make things possible to happen. They organize our behavior. But there are far fewer constraints in the modern mating market than in the past. The times have changed. 
Women have plenty of agency, opportunities, and success, far more than ever before. And that across multiple domains, including education and the labor market. Women can more openly pursue sex for its own sake. They can be the demand side too, in a way that would have been foreign to their great grandmothers. Of course, they will no doubt succeed in their efforts, but that's not much of an accomplishment, frankly. What women are less in control of today is their relational destinies, which is one of my key claims that in the mating, that the modern mating market ultimately plays to men's advantage more than to women's. That is, today, men get, more, get what they want more readily and more consistently than women do. This doesn't mean that women are uniquely prone to experience all of the mating market's negative aspects. Men, too, get dumped, hurt, infected, depressed. They feel guilt. They complain. But what men seldom complain about is the price of sexual access. Men provide the social support for cheap sex, while women provide, on average, but far less than in the past, the social control against cheap sex. The double standard, which I very much realize exists, the double standard around sex has weakened but has not disappeared. That is in part because women do not naturally gravitate towards cheap sex, but they can learn to accommodate it. You've probably heard about the malleability of sexuality. Well, in this domain, malleability is very obvious. Not so long ago, I was watching the HBO series, The Pacific, in which the surviving American soldiers return home after battling the Japanese in Okinawa in 1945. One veteran in particular returns back to his home in the state of Alabama, another one to New Jersey. In the case of each of those characters, it becomes obvious to viewers that regardless of what their sexual wishes might be, marriage was considered the only intelligible way not simply to access sex, but to live your adult life. Culturally, marriage was in the cards, so to speak. And those men who had sacrificed so much on the battlefields in the Pacific were going to have to sacrifice a little bit more in order to be considered marriageable to the women in their community who policed and protected each other in the domain of relationships. Marriage was the only way that anyone could access stable, legitimate sex. The only other option was paying for it. Then everything began to change. The advent of artificial hormonal contraception in 1960 and its uptake slowly over the next 20 years brought what economists call a technological shock to the social system and to the mating market in particular. While sometimes people today talk about a rediscovery of our primal sexuality or a return to our non-monogamous roots of 10,000 years ago, I hold that those were made possible not by a rigorous study of history or anthropology, but by a mid-20th century invention, it's the synthetic hormonal contraception. To be sure, things did not change overnight. No massive social change of any considerable size changes that quickly. But change things it did. Less reliable contraceptive devices or condoms, which men have never much appreciated, could now be avoided. Marriage plans could be stalled. One or two fewer mouths to feed. Careers could be developed without fear of interruption early. This novel technology, one economist correctly observed, affected all women, including women who were never on the pill. 
over time, the wide uptake of contraception split what was once a unified mating market where everybody was together. The advent of contraception, and especially its uptake, split it into distinctive components or markets. One for sex, one for marriage, and with a large in-between section of significant relationships of varying commitment and duration, including cohabitation. By relatively unified, I mean that the majority of sex among singles used to occur in and during the search for a mate, someone to marry. My grandfathers may or may not have slept with the first woman they met, I do not know. But it's safe to say they didn't approach their 20s in quite the same way that men do today. To them, sex entailed commitments because it risked pregnancy. Today, sex entails far less commitment because it often doesn't even risk pregnancy. Now we have this split mating market, one corner of which is primarily for people who are interested in short-term relationships, hoping for sex with no strings attached. The other corner of which are people interested in making the strongest of commitments, marriage. Marriage is still widely considered to be expensive, which means it's a very big deal, not entered into lightly, costly in terms of fidelity, time, finances, personal investment and commitment. Sex, meanwhile, has become comparatively cheap, not that hard to access. But the mating pool isn't just split into different corners now. It's also gender imbalanced in a way that it did not used to be. And that part makes all the difference. There are more men in the sex corner of the pool than women, and more women in the marriage corner of the pool. So when a woman signals that she's interested in sex more than stability, men gather rather quickly. But she can be as picky as she wants. As people age, they tend to drift from left to right here, meaning they more intentionally wish any sexual behavior that they engage in to serve the purpose of meeting someone to marry. But given their different biological clocks and their different sexual preferences, men and women tend to drift over at different ages and different paces. So what we have here is called the sex ratio hypothesis, which holds that an oversupply of unmarried women in a community or group gives men their considerably more power in romantic and sexual relationships, which of course translates into lower levels of relationship commitment, less favorable treatment of women by men, a more permissive climate wherein women receive less in exchange for sex. And that's, keep that, this happens not because women are more permissive, but because men are more permissive. In other words, the minority in each of these corners has more power over what happens next in those two corners. So meanwhile, we see more women than men in the marriage corner of the mating market. The disparity might not seem massive at face value, but it doesn't need to be a big disparity for its influence to be keenly felt. This disparity allows men to be more selective, to seem more fickle, cautious, insisting on sexual experience before committing. They seem picky, but pickiness is not a personality trait. It's a social phenomenon. To plenty of women, it appears that men are just plain afraid of commitment. But I don't think men are afraid of commitment at all. The sex ratio difference prompts an oversupply of women searching for a marriage partner, 
compelling them to compete for marriageable men in a far more evident fashion than prior generations. This competition prompts some women to cut poor deals, meaning to get scared, to marry a person who turns out not to be the right partner, and then to want out. That is, to marry and then to regret it. This is why women are twice as likely to pursue a divorce uh, or two out of three divorces are pursued by women rather than men because they feel like they've cut a bad deal. Or it happens that sometimes it means they're not going to marry at all. Demographer Stephen Ruggles, who ran the, the, the National Demography Association in the United States, holds now the idea that one in three women in their 20s will not marry at all today. Classically, historically, it was 5 to 10 percent. He thinks that's about to surge to one-third. This is in the United States from the census from 2000 to 2014. The share of married men and women between the ages of 25 and 34 and the share of never married. In 14 short years, we've crossed paths and a, a radical difference has emerged in 14 years years. This mating market split is not absolute, of course. It's not like they're completely separate from each other. The divide is real, but it's invisible. Men and women can and do participate in both corners of the market at the same time. They may drift over from being marriage-minded to being willing to have one one-night stand and then to say, ah, I, I, I regret that. I'm going back over here. And it's also not true that starry-eyed women are now simply just being more efficiently duped or hoodwinked by skirt-chasing, commitment-phobic men. Many women don't mind this new mating market and its dynamics, at least for a while. In fact, some critics argue that fertility control and women's flourishing careers are clear signs that the exchange model of sex for resources is just plain breaking down. Since women no longer need men's resources, certainly that latter observation is accurate. Women no longer need men's resources in a way that your great-grandparents would have needed it. In fact, both sides of the exchange model have taken a hit lately, since men's options for accessible sexual experiences have likewise increased. So does it mean that the underlying exchange model is faulty? Am I leaning on a house of cards? I've been called a bigot plenty of times. Am I anachronistic too? Out of touch with reality, 21st century? No, the underlying model is not faulty because the exchange model is rooted in stable realities about male-female differences that are not socially constructed and will not disappear. The model may be old-fashioned, it's not faulty. For the exchange model to fail, men and women would have to alter their collective preferences, not just their personal preferences. That is, men would become no longer known and socially rewarded for seeking sex, while women would begin to be afraid of commitment. Men would long for emotional satisfaction and validation. Women would be more readily betting complete strangers. Men would cry more. Women would care less. Men would pine to stay home longer with their infants. Women would spend inordinate amounts of time watching soccer. They'd become hooligans. All rather unlikely scenarios, don't you think? Rather, what has happened is that each side of the model, the supply of sex and the supply of resources, is increasingly being met outside of the relationship in a manner that is perceived to be less costly or less risky to each one which renders their sexual unions less consequential 
and ultimately less stable. And since marriage is still considered expensive, which is a very good thing, it means we're seeing a lot less of it, which is bad. So some say we've advanced, actually, that we marry now for love, not for money. But if anything, the modern mating market feels more nakedly economic, far less social than the pre-pill one. There's little shelter offered anyone. Every man and woman is now completely on their own to discern their feelings and to make authentic decisions to live in step with their feelings. Leslie Bell is a combination sociologist and psychologist. She perceives women's lives today as profoundly puzzling or enigmatic. Why? Because she laments, she complains. Their unprecedented sexual, educational, and professional freedoms have given birth to contradictory and paradoxical consequences in the realm of sex and relationships. In other words, she says, the skills women developed to get ahead educationally and professionally have not translated well into getting what they want in relationships. She calls that an enigma, a puzzle. I say it's nonsense. The only contradictory puzzling thing here is the unrealistic expectation that the securing of ample resources independently of men would have no consequences or only positive effects on how their relationships transpire. She thinks the emotional energy bred by career success would seem to be transferable into relationships. Instead, what she uncovers and labels as puzzling is the straightforward economic reality that sex and even marriage are at bottom exchanges. If women no longer need men's resources, the things which men can and always will provide in exchange, and if women can minimize sexual risk, pregnancy risk, and they can, then sex simply becomes less consequential, easier to get or to give away, and relationships far more difficult to navigate because strong commitments are simply just less necessary and thus slower to emerge from men. Women still want men. They want love, and this is a very noble thing. But the old terms that prompted men's provisions are on the rocks. There's no paradox here. It's exactly what we should have expected. In other words, power asymmetries or power differences have been worsened by egalitarianism, an idea that is almost unthinkable to my peers. That's why they label it a puzzle. They don't get it. I see it plain as day. Eros. Erotic love cannot but suffer under these circumstances. There's really no paradox here. But there is a great deal of rising tension around it. Such tension is being keenly felt, at least in the United States, on university campuses as administrators are trying to figure out how to curb sexual assaults. There is a social problem there. The problem, however, extends well beyond the campus. But where facts turn to fiction is in how they talk about sexual violence. That talk formally ignores, yet implicitly admits, the reality of sexual exchange by emphasizing the concept of consent. The concept of consent implies the giving and the receiving of something valued. Consent, whether it comes in the form of yes means yes or no means no, consent presupposes distinctive roles with men as primary pursuers and women as recipients of sexual pursuits. Men as the one who need to seek consent, women as the ones who 
must give it. This is all evident in how scholars, school administrators, journalists, and activists are talking about sexual violence and the key way in which campuses are trying to reduce it by making more explicit consent laws. On the one hand, it's heartwarming to see universities finally care about what's going on in the relationship lives of students. On the other hand, presuming the sex act itself is malleable by law and subject to bureaucratic oversight is utter hubris. Sexual consent, while no doubt a key value, is also far more of a spectrum than a dichotomous variable. There is no way to assure sexual encounters on campus completely free of nuance, judgment calls, or free of regret. The nature of sexual exchange is deeply imprinted on our collective psyche. To imagine pressure-free, sex-positive, egalitarian utopias is just to ignore the real world of men and women who, for all their fine qualities, nevertheless experience and demonstrate no shortage of brokenness, lying, cheating, deception, and aggression. Collectively, it means we remain unwilling to wrestle with the dark side of human personhood, especially, but not exclusively, in men, concluding that we need instead to enforce speech laws on them and that that will reform their motivations and their actions. We want men to act better, more nobly here, but we are unwilling to admit that men are more apt to do the right thing when they are socially constrained, not just individually challenged or threatened. Instead, we seek to alter how their encounters are going to transpire. It's a fool's bargain. The sooner we recognize this, the quicker we will see the wisdom in privileging some sensible social control of sexual behavior rather than relying solely on personal control. For example, in the United States, it's very common to have men and women live in uh, on different rooms on the same dormitory floor, right? It used to be we would have a woman's dormitory, residence hall, and a men's residence hall with visiting hours that ended by midnight, if not before. That is a natural social control barrier, prevents plenty of unwanted, unconsensual sex from happening. It's a social barrier. So, I talk about deceit, control, power plays, power imbalances. It starts to seem a wonder that any couple ever actually commits and marries in a world awash in cheap sex. Am I this pessimistic? Not really. People do fall in love. Observation and experience, together with evidence from the psychology of relationships, reveals that a common shift occurs wherein love and trust, confidence, and self-sacrifices emerges in relationships. It's typically quicker to develop in women than in men, although that is not always the case. But the exchange model would seem to suggest that men somehow willingly pay a much higher price for sexual access than they need to on the open market, right? It's true. Why is it true? because they want to. And many other men eventually want to. They want to fall in love. Many want children. Their autonomy or their time becomes less valuable to them. They may perceive their own attractiveness beginning to fade. And even though they feel like they're in the driver's seat and it comes to the mating market, Ideal spouses grow less numerous over time. 
Cohabitation expert Scott Stanley perceives this too, noting that a man's developing commitment, typically in the form of day-to-day -day sacrifices, uniquely signals a transition from a winner-loser, zero-sum game to that of trust in a woman, expectation of a future together with that particular woman. That signaling reinforces for him additional sacrifices. And what it does is economically, it fosters an exchange market between the partners that is non-competitive, where the goal is to maximize joint outcomes. Let me tell you that. The key word here is non-competitive, meaning external options, other men, other women, become decreasingly attractive and the couple begins to invest in the good of each other. In other words, they are falling in love. Here you can't help but break from the exchange language. Love is not something one could readily model mathematically or statistically as the product of units of joint attraction, educational match, sexual chemistry, personality fit, rational evaluation, and just happenstance. Nor is love like a threshold of sorts, below which is not love, above which is love. No, love emerges. It occupies a reality that was hereto, hereto, here, heretofore not existent, and yet one that tends to act back on those two individuals, as well as outward onto other people. The emergence of love is a mysterious process. It involves attraction, of course, but falling in love defies simple hormonal or economic or psychological descriptions. When asked about it, lengthy personal narratives are more likely to do it justice since these are more holistic and rooted in a lived experience. You can learn more about love in a novel than you can in any textbook. Indeed, falling in love is kind of an unfortunate way of talking about it. Love emerges, sometimes slowly, sometimes more quickly. Cheap sex, however, is poorly adept at generating love. It can, however, harm and unravel love as countless breakups and divorce proceedings attest. Historically, Signaling love by sacrificial acts has become very important for men to display. Without such sacrifices, a more committed partner, more often the woman than the man, begins to become aware of her very vulnerable position in terms of power in the relationship. She wants it more, so he has the power. She's apt to feel more devalued, taken advantage of. This resulting scenario is so common. Not just because young adults spend more time on the mating market than they did previously, or because fewer of them are marrying, but because Professor Stanley and his colleagues perceive a thinner association between romance and commitment today. It's weaker. In other words, they're detecting the presence and the effects of cheap sex. That is, sex without sacrifice, which he says is apt to lead to ambiguity, frustration, anxiety, power plays, not exactly the fertile soil for commitment and love to develop. So why care about sex and marriage markets, ratios, prices, premature entanglements, exchanges? People should just be free to do whatever they want, right? That would be the American way. Choice and options are sacred, aren't they? The defining cultural hallmark of modernity. So long as love isn't forced and consent is our byword, let people do whatever they want, right? Unfortunately, truly free choice does not exist here. It never has. What we have done is exchanged an older set of challenges for a newer set of challenges. 
now that the general mating market has morphed into two different components and given rise to two vastly different power differences dynamics within each. Talk to any early 30-something-year-old woman who wishes to marry, and, and not a few men, and you're apt to get an earful, a window into the vagaries and the frustrations of finding a spouse today. It's a very different world than before. The physical risks of sex, pregnancy primarily, have dramatically lowered and the independent trajectories of women have soared, both a product, directly and indirectly, of significant advancements in fertility control. Thus, this new era has been remarkably good for women in terms of career options and labor force successes and more challenging on them relationally. It's not the account of every young woman, of course, but the route to marriage is more fraught with years and failed relationships than it was in the past. Once familiar structures, stories, rituals about romance and marriage, how to date, what is it like to fall in love, who should I marry, when, those are collapsing, sustained only in smaller subgroups, and that with increasing difficulty. In the United States, even the Mormons are worried. So, sex is cheap. It is more widely available at lower cost at all, to all than ever before in human history. What has emerged is not unlike the decline of the local, locally owned boutique shop and the rise of big box discount chains. Cheap sex has been mass-produced with the help of two distinctive means that actually have very little to do with each other, the wide uptake of the pill and mass-produced high-quality pornography. And then they're made more efficient by communication technologies like online dating and Tinder. They drive the cost of sex down, make real commitment more expensive, challenging to navigate, have created a massive slowdown, massive slowdown in the development of long-term relationships, especially marriage. They've put women's fertility at risk, driving up demand for infertility treatments. In the United States, it is a, a massive industry. And it's even taken a toll on men's marriage ability. And it's changed how men and women actually think about themselves what they think sexuality is, what the point of relationships is. Cheap sex doesn't make marriage unappealing. It just makes marriage less urgent, more difficult to accomplish. Many men feel powerless to say no to the cheapest form of sex, pornography. They wish they could say no. The women who love them lose out on their monogamous attentions. There are other losers in this new system too. Women who prefer a shorter and nobler search for a mate are less likely to get what they wish. Alternately, they get their wish, but they find themselves surrounded by unmarried options later, wondering, what if I hadn't settled so early? A holistic person-centered dating service is not just around the corner. And if you think Tinder is a holistic, person-centered dating service, we should have a discussion. Those who prefer child-rearing to a paid career feel disdain. They have to form like-minded communities to counter that disdain they feel from their peers and the culture at large. There are losers in this new market, too. I'm offering no wistful memories for the past. The past had its problems. But we find ourselves in an in-between spot right now, one between long taken for granted rel traditional relationships that were anchored in marriage and the future yet-to-be-determined relationship system characterized 
by what one social theorist called confluent love. Fluid love. There's not going to be two dominant systems. Marriage, as it has long been understood, is in the throes of deinstitutionalization. Meant to be a haven in a heartless world, as social critic Christopher Lash called it, marriage is fast becoming a contest. One more social arena of competition. Social conservatives tend to bemoan all this and other developments. But what social conservatives want is what they cannot have. They want a culture in which marriage is normative and expected, together with all that desired fruit that came with the new model, greater freedom, independence, flexibility, time, opportunity. They can't have it both ways. In place of a marrying culture, we have what I call the emerging genital life. Great but infertile sex is now a priority, a hallmark of the good life, signaling that sexual expression and how we experience that is close to the heart of being human. You can hear it in the shift in language around sexuality and its expression from that of sexual desires to sexual needs a lingo that's dominated now by public health, psychiatry, and even law. Quality sexual experiences are increasingly thought of as just as pivotal to human flourishing as clean air, clean water, food, shelter, antibiotics. We expect a lot from sex and from our relationships. Meanwhile, any trace, any form of suffering in relationships is considered a clear signal of an unhealthy state. We're treated to no sense of marriage as a domain of struggle or trial or a place for our sanctification. That's foreign language. While our most distant ancestors were no doubt acquainted with sexual pleasure, they associated it with eventually babies. They're part of the package deal. Not anymore. Sex is about pleasure with a side of bonding. About fertility, which is actually the absolute pinnacle of natural human creativity. Fertility is the pinnacle of creativity and a woman's unique capacity. About that, we've become ambivalent. Meh. Indeed, the very word procreative is typically met with eye rolls, contempt. The U.S. fertility rate has dropped 10% in the past decade alone, and it wasn't very high before that, and yours is worse. If this is evolution, the widely respected U.S. Nationalist, uh, na naturalist writer Wendell Berry wonders, what sort of higher version of humanity we're evolving toward? It's odd, he said, that simply because of our sexual freedom, our era should be considered extraordinarily physical. But physical it is. Wendell Berry tags it all with far less optimism than most people have. He perceives the shift as constituting just another element not of the organic, local, and virtuous life, but as a synthetic compound of our Western penchant for bigger, cheaper, more, and diverse. It's an ironic postmodern intersection where Walmart meets sex. Industrial sexuality, he calls it. Industrial sexuality. Our latest effort to, to conquer nature by exploiting it and ignoring the consequences. Industrial sex then establishes its freeness and its goodness by an industrial accounting, tallying sexual partners, 
with the inevitable idea that somehow the body becomes a limit on the idea of sex. And sex will be much more abundant someday if we could actually do it with robots, which of course is probably right around the corner. Meanwhile, the organic citizens among us, those who are skeptical about the boundless promises of the sterile and undisciplined life, are commonly portrayed as restrictive, misogynist, backwards. Some passionately object to this kind of talk, especially in the United States. This is partly because the intellectual and political movements to degender society largely originated there. Being male or female is powerful stuff. More robust, more evident, and more resistant to malleability than we realize. Chromosomes do not care what we think of them. Ovaries and testes are not assigned to us at birth. Zygmunt Bauman, the recently deceased Polish social theorist, he observed with profound irony that culture is now perceived as the inherited part of our identity that shouldn't be tinkered with. While what we long understood as nature, the stuff of genetic inheritance, is ever more presented as amenable to human manipulation and open to choice. Culture we inherit, nature we change. Back in the year 2000, Professor Dick Udry, who was a demographer at the University of North Carolina where I went to graduate school, he wrote about the biological limits of gender construction in the top journal in sociology. He introduced me to scholarly controversy by wondering whether gender may not simply or socially, so, solely be socially constructed as we were all taught to believe in sociology. Traditional social science models of gender begin with the postulate that in humans, males and females are born neutral with respect to behavioral predispositions. These models assume that be any behavioral differences between the sexes emerge as a consequence of socialization, social structure, human beings shaping us. But the empirical evidence just didn't support this model. It just wasn't there. In fact, in a recent review, of 21 sources of data revealed that most sex differences are actually larger. Differences between the sexes. Most, they're larger in cultures with more egalitarian sex role socialization and greater gender equality. The more you try for gender equality in your society, the larger the sex role differences tend to become. The notion that males and females have evolved to, to be the same is not just untrue, it makes no sense. This doesn't amount to a complete dismissal of social structure or socialization. It's just about recognizing that boys and girls are not blank slates to begin with, and that limitations are often paired with strengths, interests paired with disinterests. Biology Professor Udry concluded, sets limits on the construction of gender and the effectiveness of gender socialization. He says we can push against those limits, but he said only draconian efforts will get us anywhere. This is a quote from him, Agno atheist, according to his daughter. He said, a social engineering program to de-gender society would require a Maoist approach, continuous renewal of revolutionary resolve and a tolerance for conflict. Maoist approach, social engineering, 
revolutionary resolve. Heavy words from a man who said he really didn't care what happened. He was willing to mess with Mother Nature. He didn't take a position on the morality of it. He just said it's going to be very, very, very difficult. Even a generally sympathetic Pope Francis recognizes that this is not about rights. It's about ideological colonization. And since this nonsense builds upon a theory of sex differences that it has no evidence to it, it's not going to work. In the end, I'm happy to report that men and women still pursue each other, and they often want each other to stay. They fall in love. Men still appreciate the feminine genius, as Eve Stein called it. Women are still attracted to masculinity. They pair off because each has something the other wants. Many still marry because each has something the other feels they cannot live without. I realize that the idea of complementarity is not a popular one. Falsely pitted as it often is against visions of egalitarian utopianism. But like it or not, complementarity remains obvious in the social and the natural world. In fact, egalitarianism depends upon the complementarity of men and women. It presumes sex distinctions that it then actively seeks to undermine. Why? Because difference, in the end, attracts people. And difference, frankly, works. Thank you very much. Ako vidíte, do diskusie môžete prispievať svojimi otázkami cez webovú stránku Slido, treba dať hashtag BHD a potom označiť UPC. A ja by som týto poprosila o technickú podporu, pretože tento môj inštrument nefunguje. A začala by som najprv svojou otázkou. Bude priestor aj pre otázky z publika, takže ak nemáte k dispozícii smartfón alebo nejakú inú záležitosť tohto typu, tak sa môžete prihlásiť, dostanete k dispozícii mikrofón, ale budeme preferovať otázky zo slajda, pretože tie musí získať verejnú podporu, viete, je to trochu férovejšie. And now I'll switch into English, I'm sorry about that, it was just technical stuff. I'll start with my first question and then we'll go to slido, so people have time to vote for questions and they can submit further questions. My first question is, why should men care about the situation that you described? Um, right. want to well, do something about it. Sure. They, they, they tend to care less than women do about it, obviously. Mm -hmm. They perceive themselves um, as in a, on average, a better position in the mating market in general. Uh, they perceive themselves as a weaker position in the sex market, but, I mean, they're used to, like, being turned down, right, in mm -hmm. some ways. So th that, do that doesn't bother many men. And when, they c when it comes time to like, oh, I think I would like to, to, to marry, they still, that's, that's not an overnight transition. That's a slow transition. And they feel like they're in charge of, more or less in charge of how that happens and what pace. Now they can overplay it, they can misplay it, they can wait till wa they're too old in some ways. They can wait, they, they start to realize that ideal spouses are being taken off the market by getting married. I mean, they can misplay it, but they still feel like they have more power in setting the pace of the relationship and setting the, you know, whether sex happens, or how early in the relationship. So they, they, they feel like they have more power. And it's, it, it, typically it's true. I agree. <laughs> I got this I'm back sorry. and it's I wish it wasn't that way. It wasn't that way prior to the pill era. Women had a cartel, a monopoly on, on, on how relationships transpired. And it was a what economists would call like a, a, a trade off, an exchange. Okay. Well we'll go to the questions from Slido okay. now, because that's the people's choice. Um 
Question with the most likes. Should people get to know each other sexually before marriage? And how should they do that? Right. It's, uh, I mean, should they? Well, here you're going to have to lean on your, your uh, religious upbringing or values in, in terms of a particular moral answer. An empirical answer would suggest, I mean, premarital sex is not usually a good predictor of long-term stability. In fact, I'm working on a paper right now with the National Study of Family Growth. We're actually using religious categories to predict longevity of marriage, who lasts one year, five, 10, 15, 20 years into marriage. And the interest is in religion and religiosity, but we have other kinds of variables we include as controls. I tell you, the, the, the premarital sex control variable is, is strongly, inversely, uh, negatively re uh, related to, you know, staying together, right? So people talk about sexual chemistry as if somehow um, it's, to use a, a, a term, exogenous to the relationship, that it's somehow, it's outside of the relationship and I bring it in and we see if we have sexual chemistry or not and we just don't or something. I tend far more to think that sexual chemistry is an endogenous trait. It's, it's something you develop with this person, right? And it's much more um, securely developed when it's inside the, the unity and the, and the stability of marriage. Apart from that, there's, there's always sort of power plays and um, insecurities and things like that. So, I mean, the evidence suggests that's not a good idea. It's a very common Occurrence, but the evidence which is, is not a good idea. Does premarital sex play the same role, um, regardless of uh, of its frequency or of its beginning? Is it is it there no, any difference? I, there is actually a difference. Uh, Peter Arcidiakono, he's an economist at Duke University, has studied this stuff with the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, uh, which is in it to adulthood now. He talks, I mean, again, economically, he talk, there's a threshold, like once sex is introduced, then it's, it's continuously expected. And if, if people try to reel it back in and say, oh, no, 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 I made a mistake, I mean, it's hard to stop a sexual relationship without the relationship collapsing. Uh, it, it's, it's uncommon, right? In the book that... Should I, oh, you've got this slide. In the book that's coming out in September, um, I highlight our city Akino's work and uh, how common accounts are of you know people who had sex early and then decided, well, maybe that was a mistake, and they try to like slow down, it, and it's very hard to to stop it once it started because there's there's a a high bar to entrance typically but the bar to continuity is much, much lower, of course. So to, s to try to raise the bar after you've already set it low is really hard. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is there a threshold to that, uh, like a, sp a specific amount of time that if it passes, you <coughs> can start having premarital sex that it won't yeah, affect right. your relationship because <laughs> you've had it for, s I mean, you've been doing it for so long. Uh, I'm not sure there's a, a, an obvious bar. Um, to use an example from cohabitation, okay, which implies premarital sex, uh, the presence of engagement is typically understood to be less risky for cohabitation than prior to engagement, okay? So basically, cohabitation is, remains a pretty good predictor of divorce, right? It's not a guarantee, but you know, it's a it's a solid predictor of it. It becomes a weaker predictor if the cohabitation begins after engagement. It's a much stronger predictor prior to engagement. So okay. uh, I'm not saying that, oh, it's it's non consequential um, after engagement, because back to the study I was just telling you about, like the mere presence of premarital sexual activity is a 
remains a good predictor of divorce later. So right. as does number of premarital sexual partners, things like that. People always think that what they do prior to marriage doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know where they get that idea. Like, like they become a different person. I mean, you carry forward into marriage yourself and your experience and the identity you fashioned and the thoughts and, I mean, um, it's not like we're starting from a blank slate when we exchange rings. Good to know. I, I'm not married, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> All right. Well, the next question is, is sex the major reason to hurry into marriage for men? Is it a good reason? Is it? Say that once more, please. <laughs> is sex the major reason to hurry into marriage for men? So do men enter marriage primarily Typically because of sex? Typically not. I mean, I think uh, in the United States, that was more characteristic of evangelical Protestants. So they would be marrying at 18, 19, 20, 21 because purity was such a, a value to them, not chastity, but purity, that they rushed into it before they were mature, before they knew that they were ready, before he had signaled... Uh, really stable commitments and economic promise and things like that. So um, I'm still blanking on What was the statement, the other question? Well, the, the last part is, is it a good reason? Of oh, men pursuing men sex. Men pursuing sex. Well, marriage for sex. No, because, I mean, people develop a couple-specific sexual culture. It can become a, a good culture, it can become a toxic culture, a broken culture, and need help and fixing. But like a, a couple sp specific way of, of sexual chemistry together. So, you know, rushing towards that uh, is, is, well, is no guarantee that you'll get it, right? And it's, it's the kind of thing that, um, like I've been hearing a little bit about the premarital uh, instruction that you can get uh, in the diocese here now, like where they ask you very tough questions about uh, your existing sexual practices and your sexual expectations, right? That's a very helpful conversation to have prior to marrying because it is you and your spouse who is establishing an intimate relationship only with each other, right? As I said, it can break down, it can be good, but like to think that you have to rush forward and that, that will improve your chances of having uh, what you would call a good sex life in marriage just doesn't really make sense. I mean, I think one can have that whether you marry at 40 or at 20. Yeah, I guess the question was asking Or not about have it. Yeah. I mean... But is it just about the ac access to sex that men get no. from marriage. Is it? No. You, no. you said mean, it in the men lecture. Don't it's not about get, that. Men don't, as I said, said and I lecture. need to explain it a little better. Men are serious about marriage when they start sacrificing for a particular individual consistently, not just buying her drinks, flowers once, like when daily sacrifice, not just purchases, sacrifices. Oh, you're across town? I will come pick you up. Oh, you need to ride to the airport? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bring you to the airport. I'll come and get you at midnight. No, take an Uber. That's not a sacrifice. Like, when women start seeing sacrifices from particular men is a signal that they're invested. Until that time, all bets are off. We just got great criteria for, you know, there you go. choosing between men. Um, next question. I mean, this is what Scott Stanley, the, he's a specialist in... Um, uh, relationship couples, things like this. And he's like, the, the key signal is, has he shifted from kind of being ho-hum about her to he's the one doing more of the sacrificing? When he doesn't, I mean, when he's kind of in control, he seems like he's in control of the, the, the pace or the, ma the, the marriage end of the market. When he starts sort of looking to her as if like, I'm sacrificing for you, and she feels like, wow, I'm now important to her, to him, right? I mean, 
women should be able to discern when that happens. They, I think they can. A lot of them discern it prematurely, think they see signs of it, and it's not there. We do that. Men know when it happens because they consciously start doing it. Okay, next question from the audience. What can we, women, do to shift the current mating pool status more towards commitment? Yeah, that is the number one most asked question of me when I give these talks. And the frustrating thing is I, I never have a really uh, good answer because what we have is a social problem. It's not, it's not a woman's personal problem, okay? So take, for example, some couple, right? She wants to, she really values chastity. He does too, but she values it more than he does. That's very common. Um, or in a pinch, and she's more willing to value it. He has, he sees other options, right? And so then she's frustrated. She's like, well, I, you know, chastity prior to marriage, in marriage. And it's, it's harder for him to go there because he feels like it, he doesn't have to with other people, right? So, be, so she feels like, oh, is it something about me? No, it's something about her social situation, the situation of women, right? It can't really be helped, the, 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 the market that has become, um, because what, what I used to call the cartel of women, right? A cartel, a micro, like OPEC, right? The oil producing nations. They work together to you know, control the flow of oil so they control the price of oil. You pump a little bit less oil and the price goes up and that makes those countries happy. It's not really different in terms of uh, women and sex, but there is no cartel anymore. That was busted to smithereens when the pill came along. Um, and it's not coming back. I mean, now women are each, own, each other's worst enemies now in this, and they don't realize it and there's nothing they can do about it, really. That was a very hopeful <laughs> ending. <laughs> Here's what's the most important thing I think you can do, is recognize this stuff, and not be fools and wait until age 30 and they're like, oh, that's why, right? I wish I had known this when I was 20, right? To see the reality of the challenges early so that you're not shocked or surprised when you start to feel some of the some of it happening. It doesn't mean the answer is not to become easier. I mean, what we need is an, a collective elevation of price. You can do that on micro scales, you know, in groups of people, right? Congregations, or parishes, I guess you call them. Um, but it, you know, it's, you can't do that on a campus or on a uh, in an entire community in a way that used to be the case prior to the pill. Like I can give you the example from post World War II New Jersey and Alabama. That was just the way it was. Sex was risky. It's just not the case anymore. Okay, we will now accept questions from the audience, and I cannot see too well, so... I'm not entirely um, sure I've got this on, so you might have to translate for me if this oh is wow. working. Oh, wow. So, um, I can't see where the microphone is right now, but do we have... Okay, the microphone's in the back, and are there any questions in the audience? Uh, no, no raised hands. There is a raised hand in the front row, almost the front row. Is it working? All right. Yeah. Good. Vážený pán Regnerus, veľmi pekne vám ďakujem za váš odvážny výskum, pravdivý postoj a veľmi kvalitnú prednášku. Veľakrát ste spomenuli antikoncepciu ako zlomový okamih, ktorý nastal v symbióze vzťahov muža a ženy. Ja si stále myslím, že nevyriešime problém pro life a pro family a 
týchto cieľov, ak sa nepopasujeme s problémom antikoncepcie. Toto je tvrdenie, ktoré vyplýva z teológie tela a jeho komentátora Christopera Vesta. Mohli by ste, prosím, vašim úžasným vedeckým jazykom popísať yeah. vašu skúsenosť s textom teológie tela a s perspektívou z od, yeah. zničenia a odstránenia antikoncepcie. Sure. Ďakujem. You know, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned Christopher West. Uh, I had a line in here from Christopher West I was going to use, but I thought, ah, maybe he's just kind of an American popularizer of theology of the body, so I struck it. So it's funny to get a question about Christopher West. You underestimated the audience. I did. Oh, shame on you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so kind of related to what I said, I mean, it, it's possible for communities to sort of strike it from, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's much hope in th theology of the body, but there's like it is, it is certainly, how do you say this, spitting into the wind. It's, it's really swimming upstream, right? So one is challenge is just to, to make it known what it is and what it means. Um, it's honorable, it's noble, I like it. Uh, its popularization is slow in the uptake. It's not simple in a Twitter world. Um, so it's challenging. Um, so, but I, I think it can be realized on, in micro scales on, in smaller communities. Uh, it seems unlikely to sort of catch fire widely. I mean, even in the United States. Um, I mean, moral approval of artificial hormonal contraception is like 95% or something like that. So uh, I admire it. I think it's a valuable framework. But it doesn't really alter the fact that the playing field has changed around you. And and you don't get the freedom to 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 live in a social world apart from the rest of that, right? So you have to press forward with this and, 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 and talk about that in a world that still perceives it as foreign. Does that make sense? So I esteem it. I think it's great. Um, it's not simple. It's kind of complicated. Uh, it needs more proponents. But it's still, it, it, it's... It's operating in a, in, a, in a world that is, I don't see reversing anytime soon. That's okay. a good question. Back to Slido. What do you think about the, the evolutionary theory that love is just a chemical reaction encouraging people to reproduce? Do you believe in evolution at all? Wow. Uh, yes, I do believe in evolution. I, I'm not really much of an evolutionary scholar. I do think evolutionary psychology predicts a lot of the kind of things that I'm saying. The first exact question was... What do you think about uh, the theory well that, that love is just a chemical just reaction chemical and leads I mean, to reproduction? It's just ridiculous. I mean, love is a choice. Love is the willing, uh, the, the good of the other, the gift of self. That is not a chemical reaction. I mean, lust is a chemical reaction. Love is not a chemical reaction. Um, historically, marriage m for a very, very long time was not necessarily built around love more than it was built around the protection of women and children uh, and the, the need for men to have people help them on farms and things like that uh, and women to, for people to protect them. Love was of a different sort and not absolutely essential to that equation. Love has become a lot more common in narratives of marriage in the last 100, 150 years. But it's, it's not a chemical reaction. It's not hormonal. Okay, so you said it served different purposes than just, uh, just reproduction. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, is the cohabitation before marriage without having sex even possible and healthy for the relationship? 
Uh, cohabitation. Are we talking about sharing a bed together without sex? Probably that is, not. That is, uh, that'd be profoundly uncommon, bizarre. Uh, and, and, and what kind of precedent would you be setting? We're going to sleep in the same bed, but not have a marital relation, even though we want to get married. What, to save money or something? Uh, no, I think cohabitation is, is, a, is you know, that, it's coterminous with sexual activity. And kind of rightly so, if this is your beloved, you're in the same physical space as them. Um, you want to be one with them. I mean, why aren't you getting married if you're sacrificing for that person? I mean, typically cohabitation is like, it's a male invention in some ways that women actually tend to pull men towards today because they think it's a step towards marriage. Like, if, oh, if I can only get him to, to live in the same domicile as me, then um, we will try each other out, we'll sort of pretend, practice marriage. Like, and it, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. I mean, it's not... I mean, to, to give of self is to give your entire self. To cohabit is to hold something back. Uh, and marriage is a gift of the complete self. So I think that scenario is highly unlikely. Is there any data on cohabitation on data? without sex? You know, I probably could generate some. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you, you just so equate it with sex that, you know, I, the data that I use for my book, I could, you know, crunch numbers and see what share of the population that is currently cohabiting has not had sex with that partner in at least, let's say, three months or something. And I think it's going to be a pretty low number. But you can list the event as an inspiration okay. for when you do the work. Um, and other people will look at me like, <laughs> what? Why did, you Why did you think that? You'll say, it's people in Slovakia who asked. <laughs> okay. I get the impulse to, s to save money, um, but uh, there are other ways one can save money. You, know, you can live with your parents, you can live with roommates, and it's important to develop this relationship independently of a shared space. Um, again, it's how bad does he want you? Is he willing to sacrifice living with you and sleeping in the same bed with you until you're married? Do if you think um, men suggest yeah. this um, particular model in order to get closer? T Do to men's? I mean, typically, women sex? suggest it more than men because right. they think of it as a strategy to get him more interested in marriage. Is it possible as just like a step for guys to? Get the woman Typically, in, into for the bed. men, it is more of a convenience thing. All now, right. Scott Stanley, the professor, talks about it. There are different kinds of cohabiting. The most common, he, he distinguishes between sliding into it and deciding to do it. If you're going to have it, deciding to do it is better than sliding into it, but sliding into it is far more common because so f the, the most common way this happens in the United States is his apartment rent leases up, his 12 month leases up, and uh, do I sign up for another 12 months? I'm, I'm pretty serious about this woman. Hey, why don't we just move in together? Or he's got an apartment, she's got an apartment, but they're sleeping together and they're over at his apartment most of the time or hers. Why not just, you know, I'm already buying two, two pairs of toothbrushes and two sets of combs. Let's just move in together. I mean, that's sliding into it. That's the most common way it happens. All right. Next question. Stanley would say that's the oh, I'm the, sorry, I didn't mean the to worst way to, to do it. I mean, that's the least likely to succeed, meaning transition to marriage. Okay. And now we have one in Slovak that I need to translate. Um, you can translate or am I going oh yeah, to I'm, I'm going Got to it. try to do that. Um, are there any significant differences in sexual behavior um, before marriage uh, between the United States and Europe? 
significant differences premaritally? Yeah, and not really sure. I mean, I, I know that their uh, northern and western Europe, their their use of contraceptive are higher than the United States, especially uh, birth control pills and long-term hormonal implants. Um, but I don't know that their partner count is as high as in the United States. The U.S. is a, a unique place um, in terms of its sexual culture. It's, it has bits of um, puritanism at the same time as like it's the capital of pornography, right? I mean, it, it, it's a strange place in terms of sexual culture. So it f fosters this kind of um, romantic individualism, this quest for the one. And so it, 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 it fosters more frequent partner, partnering than I think in Europe. That's my hunch. Certainly, like, in terms of cohabitation, we cohabit very differently than they do in, say, Scandinavia. Scandinavia's cohabitations are more like Americans' marriages. Um, they're, they're more... S uh, cohabitation in the U.S. is very unstable. Cohabitation in Scandinavia is more stable. So it looks more like American marriages than American cohabitations do. But in terms of, you know, ex other details about the, the differences, I'm not real clear. So what do you say to long-term cohabitation, 10, 20 years? What do years? I say to... What, what do you have to well, say about that? In some ways, like, the, what are the people doing? Typically speaking, people long-term cohabit for 10 or 20 years or more because it's essentially a replace... It's, it's marriage without the name. Like in, in the United States, we, we'll call it common-law marriage where you're, you're thinking... You're, you're pragmatically thinking your marriage. You're committed to the thing. You just don't have a civil license for it or a religious thing. Um, so it's, uh, some people don't marry out of political principle. They think it's, you know, bourgeois or conservative or heteronormative. And so they don't want to do that. They'll just come. But they're essentially mimicking marriage without the license. Are there any studies on the stability of these relationships? The ones, uh, yeah, they're, they're, you can distinguish types of cohabitation, like step towards marriage, a trial marriage, this sort of marriage, but not without the, because they're, the ones that uh, are sort of like, they're ideologically opposed to marriage, but they, they wish to be, remain together, you know, those, are fair, much more long-term than this sort of uh, idea that it's a trial marriage. That's like the worst thing. So we're going to play married, see how it works, and you fight, and somebody gets on Tinder, and it's over. <laughs> Sorry. Tinder's the worst. Um, okay, we have probably the last question from the audience, depending on how fast you can answer it. People marry around uh, 30 years of age, um, and the age of first marriage yeah. still increases. Why is it? Is it, a, is it good for people? It's not good for people. <laughs> it's not good for women. It's terrible for women. Biologically. If, if, you mar if the average age at first marriage is 30, and your um, women's peak fertility runs from roughly age 20 to just prior to age 30, and you're not getting married until you're peak fertility is already starting to wane a little bit. That's just, is, you know, biologically, historically, evolutionarily irrational, unless you really just don't want children or very, very few children, which, frankly, a lot of people don't want many children, you know. Marrying at 30 is still typically time for one or two kids. It's kind of like the American ideal these days. At the same time, like, uh, many, many people can attest that Getting pregnant in the 30s is harder than getting pregnant in the 20s, including my family. Um, there has to be a ceiling in here somewhere. I, I, I can't see the average age at marriage rising much farther. I mean, it's not going to hit 40 or anything. I mean, what's more likely to occur is that the average age at marriage 
tops off around 30, 31, 32, but the share of people who are marrying is dropping. Okay. And why is it? That's part of the question. Why is the, uh, the age that marriage rising? Why is it still increasing? I mean, okay. because of the split mating market. I mean, I, I, th right. I don't think it's in um, men's or women's best interest to delay, delay, delay. I mean, one of my former graduate students and one of my former colleagues uh, did a study where they, they found like the sweet spot for marrying. And I, people take this very personally and they shouldn't. But like between 23 and 27, this sort of this sort of five year span essentially, is not too much independence. You know, you're 33 or 34, lots of independence, hard to fit somebody else's life into it. But with ample maturity, your primary education is finished, largely speaking. I mean, primary is in your college experience. Um, and you've s s signaled some, um, the man, man has signaled some earning power and consistency, and you have some idea of where you want to go in life. Um, but you're not so mature and independent that you're like, can't ram together two different lives. I mean, I, I have a a good friend who is approaching 50 still wants to marry. I still hope he does. But like, he's learned to live by himself for a very long time. And that's not simple to undo. So, we so it does right. mean like, it, it's a different kind of model of marriage, right? I mean, I had up there the deinstitutionalization slide. We've switched from a foundational version of marriage to a capstone, right? If you're marrying at 32 after you've finished your education and had some success, you're exhibiting the capstone model of marriage. You do it after you've already achieved these other things and that's the icing on the cake in some ways. That's very common. That's, that is the common model now. It's very different from the foundational model of marriage where you marry somebody so, you know, when you're a little younger and a little poorer, and you still see some education and career development well ahead of you in order to accomplish those things together, right? You pool your, uh, your, your incomes, perhaps, and cut your expenses in half, and you achieve things together. That's a, the sort of functional vision of marriage. That's what marriage was for millennia, but it has given way to this different model. All right, we have... Barely a minute for the last question. Barely a minute. Then can what you happens? Get your, can you get your answer then after there a minute? I'm cut off after a minute? Yeah. Okay. Please, can I have a timer? Um, can cohabitation before marriage for economical and other various good reasons, uh, good in quotes, sometimes uh, be sometimes a better solution for couples than living separately? Didn't we already talk about this? I think so. That's why I'm expecting a really <laughs> short answer. We already talked about this. <laughs> Somebody is waiting until I give them the answer they want to hear. Um, I understand the motivations for it, um, but again, I mean, is there any it scenario plays when it's to it plays to men's interests more than it plays to women's interests. Women are making the concessions when they cohabit. They don't think they are, but they are. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, yep. for for the talk. Please uh, give it up for Dr. Mark Rignaris.